Welcome back to our study on the book of Romans. This is the Sonship Review Part 10, and this is Session 9. I want to wrap up this last point just so we can get rid of it and move on. But we were talking about the, first, the, the verse in 1 John 1, 9. I mean, I used to live on that verse, but you, because you have already been forgiven, you don't need to do anything in order to have those sins forgiven. They were forgiven the moment you trusted Jesus Christ as your all-sufficient Savior. You don't have to do that in order to be right with God so He will hear your prayers. Because you are in Christ, you can't be any more right with God. That is the status that God has given you in your new identity in Christ. The problem is living out of that new status. Right? You don't automatically live out of it. Do you know why? Because you still have all the old ways you used to think. Now, in order to live for God, we live out of that new status that He has given us in Christ. And that is what he's talking about in Romans 12, 2. And be not uh, conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's, that's the issue that is taking place for us. We'll talk about that more next week. It has some very specific scriptures that I want us to look at. Point, uh, let's wrap this one up here. Religious tradition is pretty powerful. So much so that even with confronted, even with being confronted with the truth of the Scripture, people still go with what they've been taught their whole life. They feel comfortable with it. People normally resist change. They like the status quo. And they always try to find a way to, you know... Here's the question I hear from time to time when, when people hear this doctrine. They say, well, who else does this? Well, I mean, I guess that's, that would be the normal way to think about it. My answer is always this. The Apostle Paul, who wrote 13 books in your Bible about it. And they go, yeah, 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 but who else? I'm not really sure how you go up from there. The guy who write, wrote inspired scripture, not good enough? What, you need a contemporary. Are there other people around the country that understand this? Of course there are. And churches that do that, yes. But... By and large, most churches don't even understand that there was a mystery that was hidden from the foundation of the world that didn't get revealed until it was revealed to Paul. They, they, it, it's still a mystery. So naturally, they default to scriptures like this that were back in Israel's program. Okay, so religious tradition. Here's the next one. Why is it we don't know what to pray for as we all? Because of the influence of our flesh. Our, the flesh affects us in a very particular way in that it makes us focus on the physical, on the material, on the outward, and, it, and, it, and, and really on ourselves. And, and even when it's not on ourselves, it's still in that physical outward circumstances of life. Um, that, that's, that's what the flesh is really centered on. And, that's, and so as a result... Most of the prayers that you hear in a church prayer meeting are just that way. Someone is sick, and we need to pray for them to get well. Now, look, I'm not saying I enjoy people being sick. Of course not. But the tendency of the flesh is to think, I gotta, they got to feel better, or they got to get over this thing. If someone gets a diagnosis of some kind of cancer, that's a diagnosis none of us wants to hear. But unfortunately, it's a diagnosis that people hear every day. And, and, and so the natural tendency is to say, you know, let's pray for God to, to get, get rid of that cancer. All right, now look, let me ask you a question. Is it wrong to talk to God? Prayer is talking to God, right? I mean, that's not complicated. Is it wrong to talk to God about physical issues? The answer is no. You can talk to Him about anything you want. I hate to say it this way because it's so easy to misconstrue this. But when you are spending time, not talking to God about physical issues, but when you're praying to Him about changing the physical, outward circumstances of life, He's not mad about that, but you are wasting your time doing that. 
because that's not what he's involved in today in the dispensation of grace. But I noticed that because of so much of the old way of praying has such a hold on us, there are little bits that still tend to hang on, even after we learn the doctrine. And because of that, Eric? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that my, my grace is sufficient for thee is exactly what the answer would be for us. Absolutely. But we have so much of that old thing kind of hanging on. Look, when you went through this, it, it's not like turning a light on. It's not like one moment you think all this other and you flip a switch and now you think completely different. It's a process of learning the doctrine and then actually integrating that doctrine, you know, into yourself uh, it's, and, and understanding it. And so because of that, there are... Mm, well, let me give you an example. Years ago, there was a, um, a tsunami in Indonesia. And there were some folks that I knew, not part of this group, but there were some folks that I knew they felt badly because a tsunami hit Indonesia. And in the church they were going through, they were praying for God to help the folks that are in Indonesia. Now, there, there's a couple things I want to say about this uh, quickly. The first one is, that's the way we like to pray. Ask God to do something and then go off and just do nothing about it yourself. We love that because it really, once we've just said it, it relieves us of any responsibility. The truth of the matter is, when you learn to pray as an adopted son or daughter of your Heavenly Father, you understand that when you see someone that has a need and you are touched about that, the thing to do is not to ask God to, you know, in some very general way, but God, just please bless those folks. That's, 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 that's pretty general, isn't it? It's like the old pray for rain and we got you know, five minutes of sprinkles. It's, it's too general. So, if you see someone that has a need, what should you do? Yeah, get involved with that. Uh, look, if, if there was somebody in, in this assembly that didn't have groceries, I wouldn't, Billy and I wouldn't go home and go, now dear God, you know, Gloria doesn't have any groceries. And, you know, and, She's starving to death over there, and we just pray that, you know, you'll send some groceries her way. Wouldn't it be much better to just stop at Lowe's and get groceries and take them over there? Of course. I mean, that would be the thing to do. By the way, even in Israel's program, Jesus talked about that very issue. Someone shows up that's cold and hungry, and he says, and you say, depart, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful, what does it profit? I mean, even, even in Israel's program, you understand, you know what, this is not about wishful thinking. And we say that all the time. So what about the folks in Indonesia? How many of us are going to wind up going to Indonesia to actually do something over there? Not very many. Most of us couldn't afford to do that. And if you could, you have the time and opportunity to do that. And what would you do when you got over there? But my point is going to be, you said, well, then you don't care about those folks? Well, if I do care, here's the thing. If it's not something I can get involved in, and I understand how God is working with prayer today, then that's not a prayer issue. Can you talk to God about it? Sure you can. Can you say, I feel terrible about what's happened to those folks over there? Of course. Of course you can tell him that. Um, so it's that little thing that kind of hangs on to us about we see things. And by the way, that was the straw that broke the camel's back for these folks. Um, they were following along with the studies, but they just, they just couldn't get over that hump of... You know, God's not going to do something uh, to change those circumstances. The truth of the matter is, nothing happened magically in that. 
Everything that happened over there to recover from that tsunami happened through a series of events of people actually doing things. And, um, and, that, and that is the way that it happens. What does God want? Look, let's, look we're, we're not perfect and we do sin. So when we sin, we're not confessing our sin so that God will hear us. We're not getting right with God before we pray. So what is God after? If He's not after you to confess it or say you're sorry, what is He after? He's, what He's after is for you to stop that and start living like who He has made you to be in Christ. That's what He's after. He did this, by the way, you, I, I, I just, there's too much to say. And I'm, gonna, I'm saying it all out of order. But you understand, if He didn't put you in Christ, because this is where everything is, if all He did was save you, Here's the guy out here. He say he saves the guy. Okay? But he doesn't put him in Christ. What would be the problem with that? This is really a discussion for next week. But I've kind of opened this up because I put all this on the board. What, what would be the problem with that? If, if I'm right, and we'll look at the verses next week, that everything you get, you get because you have been put in Christ. If you're not in Christ and God saves you, what will be the problem with that? All right, all right. What, what else? Tomorrow you'll be right back where you were before He saved you. Why? Because... Everything that He has to give you, He gives you in Christ. Your eternal security is in Christ. If He saves you, but He doesn't put you in Christ, you don't have that. Are, are, you, are you with me there? If all He did was forgive your sins, but look, now, if He doesn't put you in Christ, now you need to be, people say this all the time, well, what if I sin again after I get saved? That's taken care of because you are in Christ. That if you weren't in Christ, then you should worry about what happens after you got saved. That's why everyone gets put into Christ. Okay, so... Um, but we have... Uh, look, one more idea. We have this idea about uh, prayer. It, it is, um, you know, I'm going to pray for the folks in Indonesia. D dear God, please bless those folks and give them what they need and help them recover. You know, amen. And we feel good about that because that's what that prayer was really about, us feeling good about it. We didn't actually do anything, and we put it on God. And if nothing happened, hey, here's a guy that's in a, in a terrible accident, and we go, God, he's in the hospital. Oh, I hate to use this illustration because you never know who's going to be listening to these tapes. I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. Here's someone that's been diagnosed with a disease that is going to kill them soon. Now, this, this happened in my own family. And there's someone else in my family that says to them, now you know God can heal you. I'm not doubting God can. He can air up your tire. He can, do, he can put gas in your tank. I don't, there's no limit to what he can do. The problem is, what is he doing in connection with his purpose today in this dispensation of grace? God has something he is accomplishing that if he did those things, he would actually be opposing the very thing he's trying to get accomplished. Which, by the way, is a lot more important than a tank of gas. It's an eternal issue. In fact, it's the only thing you're going to take with you when you leave this life. That's what he's trying to get accomplished. And because of how important that is, but it's an eternal thing. In our flesh, since this is the point, our flesh doesn't like to think about that. It just likes to think about what it takes for it to feel better and for it to get along and for it to have a job and for it to have 
people that like it. And, and, it, it, I mean, and who doesn't like that? I'm just saying, we're not masochists. We don't go around thinking, I just hope everybody hates me. Although, if you want that to happen, you should be a preacher and preach this doctrine. That would get you closer. But it's not about who likes me. It is about declaring the truth. And there's a lot of things working against this. One of those would be religious tradition. Because this is not what you're going to hear everywhere you go. And, 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 and the whole issue of right division is, is going to get thrown out of the window. And the fact that those other things just don't work because they make God capricious. I'll remind you again about the guy that was on vacation with his family. Works a, a, he actually taught a, 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 a class in college about these, uh, on philosophy, Christian philosophy. And so he's uh, out with his family and his kids are down at the, at the lake and his uh, little son has a beach ball and he throws it up in the air and uh, the wind catches it and blows it out in the water. And then the wind is just blowing it out across the water way too fast to swim and get it. And so his son is, you know, he's upset because he lost his beach ball. And the short story is the dad says, well, here, let's just pray for God to bring your beach ball back. So they have prayer for God to bring his beach ball back. And as the day goes on, they see these guys come by in a boat. And they kind of look at who's there and they motor on. And sometime later, they come back and, you know, they're, you know, they're looking along the shore. And they decide they pull the boat in and they get out. And guess what they've got in their hands? This beach ball. And the little boy runs up and says, oh, you found my beach ball. And, of course, they found it out on the water and they give it to him. And so he says to his philosophy class, you see... God answered our prayer, so he'd encourage my son to be able to trust God. And one of the students in the class said, So you mean to tell me that there are children in such monstrous situations that are being terribly abused, that are begging God for some kind of help and some kind of relief, but God hasn't done anything about that, but he was interested in bringing back a beach ball? And his answer was, Yes. That makes God very capricious, doesn't it? In other words, he just kind of picks and chooses. But you understand that under grace, folks, under grace, God is not, he's not that way under the law either, God is not capricious. What we're doing is pinning things on him that were never his to start with. What, what it, all of the, the terrible atrocities that God's not intervening to stop, yet all the, the other things that, that somehow now God is doing is nothing but an insult, first of all, to what God is really doing today, and secondly, it charges him with being irresponsible. I'm, I'm almost too frustrated about this issue to talk about it correctly. I just want to chop every sentence off because I'm thinking of another one to take its place. My point is to say that God is doing everything He is doing on the basis of something. Under the... Okay. Leviticus 26. I'll just show it to you. Leviticus 26. Most of you know what this is. This is the description of the five courses of punishment that were given to Moses before he died. And um, obviously, before he died. Leviticus 26. And when you go under the law, you know you are under a performance program. Yes? That means if you, do, under the law, if you do good, you get blessings. But if you do badly... You get the curses. Leviticus 26. And this is exactly the covenant, the contract that Israel entered into with God. So, Leviticus 26. Look in um, uh, verse 3. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, then I will give you, and he talks about rain in due season, and the land will yield or increase, and the trees of the field will yield their fruit. Your threshing will reach unto the vintage, the vintage will reach to the sowing, you'll eat your bread to the full, dwell in your land safely, give you peace in the land, you'll lie down, you won't be afraid, I'll get rid of the evil beast out of the land. And, and 
Uh, verse 7, you'll chase your enemies. They fall before you by the sword. And, and on and on it goes. And, that, and that's if you keep my statutes and walk in them. That's if you're going to keep this law, then you're going to get the blessings. But now, look down in verse 14. But if you will not hearken unto me, and will not do all these commandments, and if you shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that you will not do all my commandments, but that you break my covenant, I also will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, the burning egg that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart. You'll sow your seed in vain for your enemies shall eat it. And I'll set my face against you. And he goes on with a whole litany there. And we realize that in Leviticus 26, what we have are those, he says, and that's the first course of punishment. Those are the things that are actually recorded in the book of Judges. When they went into the land and they began to get away from God's law, and so that for those things described right there in Leviticus 26, if you want to see the details of that, that is the first course of punishment. And that is the details of that is recorded. Well, you see it right up there in the book of Judges. 450 years under the Judges. And then God says, and if you won't be reformed by me for these things, I'm going to punish you even more. So let's keep reading. So he says, uh, let's see, uh, and if you will not, for, and verse 18, and if you will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins, and I will, and he talks about break the pride of your power and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's when the second course of punishment came upon them. And, and by the way, break the pride of your power, we know what that is. That's over there in, uh, in Kings, because that's the, that's the dividing of the nation into the northern and southern kingdoms. And what else did he say? And I'll make the heaven as brass. And how do, you, how do you say it? Let me just read it here. He says, um, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. And I'll make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass. And your strength shall be spent in vain. For the land shall not yield or increase. Neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. What's he talking about there? The earth is iron. And the heavens is brass. There's not going to be any rain. Why? And the land is not going to yield or increase, and the fruit trees aren't going to produce. Why? Because when there's a drought, there's no rain. And just as you can see under number two up there, that happened under the ministry of Elijah. Because Elijah, and we're going to get to him, by the way, in this series, because Elijah prayed, and it rained not for the space of, anybody know? Three and a half years. And that is the drought that was talked about here in Leviticus 26. And then, the next one is, and then look down in verse, um, uh, let's see, 21. And if you walk contrary unto me and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more and more plagues on you according to your sins. And I'll send wild beasts among you which shall rob you of your children. And that is the third course of punishment. By the way, these are all predicted before they ever happen. It is the prophetic program after all, which means it is prophesied, it's talked about, it's revealed, it's not hidden. And so, he says, I'll send wild beasts among you and rob you of your children. Does anybody remember that when, that, that number three, you see Elisha up there? That happened under the ministry of Elisha the prophet. You remember, he comes into the city and the kids are out there and they're kind of making fun of him. And they're actually doing something else there, but without getting all lost in the details of that, do you remember what happens? He calls two she-bears out of the woods, and those she-bears tear up how many kids? Forty-two. If forty-two kids were mauled by two bears in this country, you reckon the country would hear about it? Think it'd be on the news? You know it would. And let me tell you, the word got around there too. Why? Because that was the signal that Israel had now entered the third course of punishment. As you're going through, I'm just trying to show. And why? Why? Because they would not follow his commandments. Because they would not keep his statutes. Because they walk contrary unto him. What's my point? The law is a performance contract. If you do good, you get good stuff. If you do bad, you get the bad stuff. And that's what people think they're living under today. So when good stuff happens, it's because God is happy with me. And if bad stuff happens, it's because God is mad at me. But Paul told you over and over again in Romans that you are not under the law. 
you're under grace. That means God is not dealing with you according to your performance. You know why? He's not using the stick. He's using the carrot. I hate to say it that way. He's not punishing you to get you in line. He is using his long-suffering and goodness and forbearance. I'm taking the words right out of the verses. Is God being long-suffering today? I'd say he is. And what are men doing? They are despising the goodness of God. So God could say, look, we've had it both ways here. We've done it where when you messed up, you got immediate retribution. And then under grace, I didn't deal with you according to your performance. By my goodness and long-suffering, I, I gave you the opportunity for salvation there. My point is to say, well, too far off on this. I'm just trying to shorten this up. Let me think a second. Look, I've got a verse in the notes. Let me just show it to you. James chapter 5 and verse 15. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. That's in the book of James. Does anybody recall who the book of James is written to? It's right there in the first verse in the first chapter. James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered abroad. Greeting. It's written to Israel. Do you want to go before that? See, we've got 13 books that are written specifically to us and about us. They are all written to the man who says that God called him to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And that is Paul. And those books are Romans to Philemon. In our review right now, we're in Romans. In our review. That's where we are. So, my point is to say, the doctrine that is contained here is specifically written for those of us who are living during the dispensation of Gentile grace. When this is over, God will go back and resume His program with Israel and bring it to a completion. But Israel's program was not under grace. It was under the law. So, I'm, I'm bringing this verse up because there's a preacher. He's, he, he believes that God is doing, he believes God is healing today. And because of that, he goes into the hospitals and he prays for people to be healed. But when questioned about why not everybody gets healed, why nobody gets up and walks out of the ICU, he says this. You've got to be kidding me. We just started this. He says this. My job is to pray the prayer of faith. It's God's job to raise them up. I did my part. If they don't walk out, then God didn't do His part. That's pretty bold. How about this one? How about you stole doctrine that actually belonged to Israel once their program resumed and tried to import it into this dispensation of grace? The whole reason I have you reading the prayer... But only David has more recorded prayers in the Bible than Paul. And that's because the Psalms, 150 of them, are full of his prayers. But in 13 short epistles, Paul lists all these prayers. And the reason I'm having you read them is because that is the way he was taught to pray. And that is the way we're going to learn to pray in the will of God and the dispensation of grace. And what is remarkably absent from all of those prayers are the physical, material, change in circumstances and outward things and, and health and, and all of that. The, he's never praying for those kinds of things because those are not the things God is doing today. So I have cataracts. You want to get rid of cataracts? You can pray for God to remove them. Or you can go to a place that does cataract surgery and you can have them removed. Funny, isn't it? The things that we always give God the credit for are the things you can never quite 
pinned down. So we interpret the circumstances. Do you know why we do that? Because we are superstitious Gentiles. So we interpret it the way we want. If it happens the way we want, God answered our prayer. All right, I'm beating a dead horse here. So, I know the buzzer went off, so let me just see if I can end this here. Okay, I'll just end it. All right, so when we come back, this is really where I've been waiting to get us. This little thing that I drew up here, this little thing, I want us to walk us through the scriptures so that you see that. If Paul didn't, if, look, there are things that God did for us when we trusted Jesus Christ that if he did not somehow tell us about it, we would never know. For instance, you, you, the only reason we know that we're forgiven is because that's what we've been told all along. But how many times, I went to church my whole life, did anyone ever say that the righteousness of God's Son was imputed to me the moment I got saved? I never heard anybody talk about that, and I never thought about it until I was confronted with those verses as a preacher and thinking, what in the world is this? I was never, look, all the things, that that's our justification. When you talk about our sanctification unto functional life, this is how we live for God every day. When you're talking about the components of our new identity in Christ with regard to that, I didn't know any of those. I couldn't have listed them for you. I didn't know God did that. How about this one? He made you accepted in the Beloved. Are you absolutely sure what that is? And if you're not, were you sure that you got it? See, I'm just, I'm, it's, it's, it is necessary, this would be much easier if we were blank slates. But we're not blank slates. We got, we got caught up in the religious tradition and the, thing, and the things that are, I'll finish it this way, and the things that our flesh likes, because it doesn't like the spiritual things that take place in our inner man, it likes the material things. God, give me a job. God, get me a raise. God, help me get better. God, let me get rid of this cold. God, let this pain in, Linda, pain in, my, in my shoulder go away. You know, God, help so-and-so that's in the hospital. Lord, help, you know, I need some rain. So, you know, and God, I need... You know what, we just, we just kind of act like he's the genie in the bottle and we rub it and we say it and we hope it comes out and if it does, then great. And if it doesn't, well, oh well, it won't keep me from saying it again the next time. We never stop and think that everything that God is doing, he is doing on the basis of something. So having said that, when you're talking about the law, and the law is a performance system. If you do good, you get blessings. If you do badly, you get punishments. And so... That, and, and so it's no secret here that if Israel, if, if they weren't having rain or if other things were happening to them, what do you absolutely know is true? They messed up. You know it's true. And, and it doesn't matter if they go, now dear God, we really need some rain. I mean, Elijah prayed didn't rain for three and a half years. Well, that's the reason it was three and a half years. But he says, and, rain for the, and, and so two years in, they're going, God, we need some rain. We need some rain. If they're not going to get rain, if you're under the law, you're not going to get rain until what? Until you repent and confess your sins and come back to God. And then when you do, God will automatically, you won't have to ask for it, because then when you're doing what you're supposed to do under a performance contract, you get the blessings. We're going to go look at this because Elijah was over there. Remember, he prayed and didn't rain for three and a half years. And at the end of a contest between him and the prophets of Baal, all of a sudden it starts raining for a reason. We'll look at that. But now we're not under the law. Romans chapter 6. Twice in a row, Paul says, for you're not under the law, but under grace. For you're not under the law, but under grace. 
Why does he say that twice in three verses? You know what I'm thinking? It's almost the equivalent of saying, are you listening? Are you awake? Are you paying attention? You ever, look, to my kids, I would all, if it was really important, say it twice. Do not go outside while I am gone. Look at me. Are you awake? Do not go outside while I am gone. Say that back to me so I know you understand it. Twice Paul goes, you're not under the law, you're under grace. You're not under the law, but you're under grace. So you know what we do? We go around acting like we're under the law. So this bad thing that's happened to me must be God punishing me. If you get something by grace, what is that? What, what is grace in that sense? It's a free gift. If, if you get it by grace, did you earn it? No, that wouldn't be. Look, if you earned it, that wouldn't be grace. Right? You didn't get it because you earned it. You didn't get it because you deserved it. You got it. Why? If God gave you something by grace, He gave it to you on what basis? If you didn't earn it, and you didn't deserve it, and He gave it to you anyway, that'd be grace, wouldn't it? So here's what I'm going to say. So if God is dealing with us under grace, then He cannot be punishing us for what we did wrong. And He is not going to do good stuff, those kinds of good things for you. Sorry, one last verse, and, I, and now I'll close my Bible, which is a preacher trick to make you think I'm almost finished. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1. Just look at this. This is, I'm sure I, I lay my eyes on this in a hurry because it's not in the notes. It's just because we're having this dis discussion this way. Let me just see if I can cast my eyes on it real quickly. Oh, come on, Mike. What were we just talking about? Right, if you don't earn it and you don't deserve it, God, that's grace. God is just giving it to you anyway. And by the way, all the stuff that God wants to give you in Christ, you get all that by grace. You didn't earn a new identity in Christ, and you don't necessarily deserve imputed righteousness. He gave it to you because, you, first of all, you needed it. You didn't know you needed it, but you needed it, and He gave it to you on the basis of grace. Now think about this verse in a second. But look, if, if God is now dealing with us under grace... That, which means He's not punishing us for the bad stuff during our lifetime. As long as this dispensation of Gentile grace is going, He's not punishing us for the bad stuff and not uh, circumstantially rewarding us you know, for the good stuff. Oh, I got a job. Oh, it did rain. Oh, it's that kind of stuff. Look, because just sometimes it rains. So if that's the basis... Okay, here's the point I'm trying to make. If that's the basis, if grace is the basis then if God is doing it at all, He is doing it all the time. As long as it's grace, it's no longer on merit, right? What I'm trying to get away from is this, this capricious God that we've invented that does some things and doesn't do other things, and you have no idea why. And the reason you can't identify why is because like that, there's no basis for anything. But God has a basis for doing what He's doing today. It is grace. That's the basis. It's a free gift. And to everyone that trusts Jesus Christ, does God offer salvation to them all? Well, to everyone who is saved, how many of them get forgiveness? Because it's under grace, you need to under, understand, if that's the principle, then everybody gets it. 
if everyone who trusted Jesus Christ gets imputed righteousness, how many get it? Everybody gets it. If, the, if they're made to be at peace with God, how many believers are made to be at peace with God? Every one of them. And if that peace and, and, and imputed righteousness and forgiveness is found in Christ, how many of us are placed into Christ? Why isn't God capricious about that? How come just some of you get imputed righteousness and others you just get forgiven? You don't get the imputed righteousness. Some of you are at peace with God, but others of you are not because I didn't feel like it today. I was going to, but I just decided not to. You see what kind of God we're creating with that nonsense? And so what we do is, we now think God is doing the one things, the, thing, the one things, hmm, the one thing that outward, material, physical, circumstantial stuff that Paul never says he's doing, in fact says he's not doing, and because it happens so randomly, we make God random. Because we make him the author of either doing it or not doing it. No wonder Paul says you don't know what to pray for as you ought. He can write it in the scripture and it'd be true for every single one of us. He didn't say some of you don't know. None of us know. And you have to be taught. But those things go kicking and screaming. This is a terrible time for you to visit with us. Do you remember the last time we were doing this? When we, we weren't in the review, when we went through it the first time. Do you remember who, who came to this church then? Audie and Kim. Who is out of town, by the way. They're, he's not here because they blew up over the prayer issue. Audie and Kim came and visited. We were right in the middle of this issue. And I looked at them and I said this. They will never be back. This is too big of a pill to swallow. But I was wrong. And you came back twice. That's your fault. <laughs> but I know this is, this is not the 101 of what we learn. Clifford was right. This is, this is tough to come in on the middle of because you've missed years of all the foundation that leads us to this point. So when we come back next time, we're going, to answer, we're going to ask those two questions that I talked to you about last time. And the first one is, why did God put you into Christ? You have to understand that. Because once you do, that allows you now to understand why He's doing what He's doing. The second, and, and, and here's the second thing. Then you find out, if this is Christ, and by the way, I didn't know how to draw Christ as a person. This was actually Crystal's idea. It was a really good idea, so I ran with it, and I'm giving her credit. So we're in Christ, but then you find out, on the other hand, Christ is in you. So the second question is, why is Christ in us? Those are the two questions we're going to answer next week, and believe me, that will revolutionize your understanding of the things that you're reading in the Scripture. And does that have anything to do with prayer? It has everything to do with praying properly in the dispensation of Gentile grace. Everything. Hmm. Can't wait for us to do that. Okay. All right. So let's have prayer and we'll be done. Father, thank you for your goodness and your grace, your long-suffering and your forbearance. And Lord, we, uh, we find ourselves at this time in history... And we know that we have trusted your Son as our Savior. And now we discover in your word that you have done all of these wonderful things for us and you have given them to us on the basis of grace, which means we didn't have to earn them and we didn't have to deserve them and we didn't have to be worthy, but they were given to us as a free gift. And it was in your wisdom that you did that because you understood that if we were ever going to become what you designed us to be, we were going to need every single one of these. And so we are grateful, Lord, that you knew what we needed before we even knew we needed it. And I thank you for these folks that come faithfully and are committed to your word. And we pray for it to do its effectual work in us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right.
See you next time.